What's that? I wasn't there because I had to show up to Zoom. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Yeah. How many people were in class last night? Two. Two? Yeah. Me and someone. Who was it? Is it Andre and then? Yeah. Yeah, straight straight line, straight, straight line between us. And, and you are here. So. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, there are three people. Okay. <laughs> Funny, I the teacher shows up. That's that's a. I mean, this is not that much better though. Like three extra people. Like that's proportionally a lot. But it's like three people. Yeah. Well, on Zoom right now, let's see how many people are on Zoom. Oop. We have. We have whatever um, six people on Zoom. Is that including me? No, it's only half. But I mean, we also have the. I, I mean, I record the lectures and it's async. So I mean, you guys, it's it's a service. You guys are paying, you know, me to teach, and and to take this class. It's it's your choice if you want to show up to Zoom or or come in person. You know, it's. Academia is a weird, a weird um, service because a lot of times students are satisfied with less. Like less is more in some ways. They're like, oh, I'm going to cancel class. Not like, woohoo! You know, like, what do you mean? I want my money back. You know, right? You know, like you go get a massage. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm only, you know, I'm going to stop the massage 15 minutes earlier. Like, what? So, but hey, everything. Everything is all online. Everything is, you know, that's the way the world works now. I'm just looking forward to when I can take this mask off. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. yeah. Said no superhero ever, right? right? So, but how how are you guys doing? Is everyone doing well? Everyone? Okay, I guess so. <laughs> all right. <laughs> In that case, time for more chemistry. Oh. <laughs> it's kind of experience and you're like, yeah. But I, I am starting to feel the end of the semester, you know, like, and the fall has always been an exciting time for me, you know, like, like, um, cause I mean, there's a kid growing up. Oh, I know, I want to ask you guys something. Something I noticed, um, there's this, like a lot of people have pumpkins still on their porches from like, I mean, from Halloween and like jack-o'-lanterns, like, do people just not smash pumpkins here? Is this not a thing in Hawaii? What? What? <laughs> what? Like in, o in Ohio, I grew up in Ohio and, and like, yeah, if, if you had your, if you had jack-o'-lanterns and pumpkins on your porch, like, like, I mean, basically probably after 9 p.m. on Halloween, it's fair game. If people just, they would just smash them. Like yeah. That's a thing. That's crazy. Oh yeah, there's a band called the Smashing Pumpkins. So okay, so that's not that's not a that's not here at all. That's okay. I mean, but it also grew up in like Dallas, like during Halloween. So I don't know. I thought they were there. Is it just a Midwestern thing? Maybe it's maybe it's a '90s thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there. I got. I don't know. I have to ask my friends in Ohio. From the 90s. <laughs> well, I've never done it. I guess I was a pretty good kid. But I imagine. I'm sorry. What? It was not like you don't even have a pumpkin patch. It's just a bunch of pumpkins in a field. You know what? I work at the pumpkin patch. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's yeah. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's the thing is the boredom. That's what, make, that's what makes you do stuff like that. Okay, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll get back to you guys. I'll ask my friends in Ohio if they still do that. Yeah, you know, there's a band called the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah, but, oh, well, huh. You guys are all good kids. I guess I, I guess I did do a little bit of mischief when I was younger, not, not too much, I guess. You, you didn't smash pumpkins? Did I what? Did you smash pumpkins? No, I don't think I did. I, was, I don't remember doing it. I always felt bad because I mean, like, of course, when you when you make a jack o' lantern, you're like, "This is my jack o' lantern," and someone smashes it, you're like, "Oh, you know, I didn't want to do that to someone else." I mean, it's a really nice sweater. We TP'd people's houses. That's bad. Why? <laughs> I thought that was like old movies. 
Oh no, oh no. No, that was me. TP is just funny. It looks funny and it's, you know, biodegradable, you know, not a big deal. You know, it doesn't require any tea, any cleanup, it just looks funny, you know, but like eggs, I mean, that can, yeah, you can chip paint, you can, you know, it just smells bad. It's not like you really hate the person. Eh, it's more, I mean, TP is more of a joke though. You know, it's probably, if you really hate the person, you probably wouldn't TP the person's house. No, thank you. Yeah. All right. Now we're talking about cooking. You're wearing the best shirt for us. Oh, yeah. And all you need is love. Well, it's not really cooking. Okay. Just throw them, just throw them away with the eggs or, or the, the TP. Oh, are you talking about the pumpkins? Actually, I, one year I got uh, all the pumpkin patch. I ate the pumpkin. I made, I turned it into pumpkin soup. Uh -huh. Hey, that's fine. I like the little, the, the, is it kombucha, whatever, the, the green ones? How do you pronounce that? Kombucha. kombucha, yeah, the, those are good. Those are tasty. All right, I guess I should talk, especially since I have the thing recording, I should probably talk about chemistry. All right. So uh, paratrans also in the in the pre uh, classroom discussion, we were talking about uh, uh, the um, uh, the progression of the course. Uh, I know that I have the next test set for right before Thanksgiving, and I know that we're we're pretty much after this, we're going to be done with these two chapters. But uh, I mean, take the test whenever you want and do the homework when you want. But I um, part of it is I, I make this class congruent with the online sections and it's easier just to like assign batches. Kind of thing and and the and the bonding is going to take a lot of time to talk about so it's gonna there's a lot of talking involved in bonding so and we can, so we can bond over bonding if you will but um so oh, thank you thank you audience members so okay uh and here's just a summary of prior properties and i guess Students liked it when I, when I mimed everything, right? So atomic radii, the idea is that you have on the, on the, on the beginning of the period, you have the, um, the not a, a, well, I guess I move in from left to right. Is that, I guess that is, I don't know, so I guess it's the other way for, for you guys. So I'll mime this way, going from left to right on the, on the periodic table, the, the atomic charge increases. So the alkalis seem to be plus one, alkalis plus two, on all the way down. The charge, apparent charge, increases by one. And so because of that, the alkalis are big, huge atoms. And then as you move across, they shrink. So they move down, they get smaller as you move from left to right. And uh, then also first ionization energy, this is the opposite. First ionization, first ionization energy, is the energy it takes to rip off an electron from the outermost uh, part of the atom. And if you have a really big atom, so a big atom, small positive center, so a big atom, uh, it's easy to rip off an electron from a big atom with a plus one center. A tiny atom on the other side with a plus eight center, it's much harder to rip off an electron from this small atom with a plus eight center versus a big atom with a plus one center. So makes sense. Uh, electron affinity, no trend, metallic character. Uh, I guess I didn't talk about going down. So for atomic radii, going down the periodic table, the, the uh, atom size increases. So that, that always works. Uh, first ionization energy, there's a few exceptions to that. Uh, at least going across, going down, I think it always increases or it always uh, decreases. Uh, electron affinity, there's no trend. Uh, metallic character, I don't agree with this trend, but the book says it's a trend, and the, the metallic character is the, the same as the first ionization energy. Well, I should say opposite. Well, it's uh, so to the left and down is more metallic, and I don't like that one because it, it relates things. I mean, what's a metal and what's not a metal, and I mean, you can say things like, you know, I mean, uh, lead is in the carbon family, so carbon is a non-metal and lead is a metal and that's down, that makes sense. And if you look at, um, so 
going across the column. Lithium is a metal, but neon is not. So that makes sense. But I mean, comparing two different elements like silver and gold, which one's more of a metal? Like, I mean, that, that's where I think that trend starts to break down. So anybody have any questions about that so far? That's a summary. So consider yourself summarized. And now going to chapter 10. And we're gonna talk about bonding. So, and we're gonna talk about bonding for the next two chapters. And uh, so there are three main types of bonding. So ionic bonding, covalent bonding, and metallic bonding. So ionic bonding is uh, one atom gives electrons to the other atom. Covalent bonding is a sharing of electrons. And metallic bonding is like this sort of a sea of electrons. So which one of these do you think is the easiest to study? You said salt, ionic bonding. Okay. The, the answer, in my opinion, the answer is ionic bonding is by far the easiest. Because if you know Coulomb's law, if you know Coulomb's law where the, the force is equal to a constant times the charge of one, charge of second over the distance between them squared, then if you know, uh, if you know Coulomb's law and then just plain old Pythagorean theorem, oh, no. <laughs> you can, yeah. Tough times. Uh, you can pretty much understand everything you need to know about ionic bonding. So ionic bonding, if you just know Coulomb's law and Pythagorean theorem, that's that's all you need to know. So so right. So you have uh, in this case you have sodium metal gives electrons to chlorine to make chloride, and they form this this matrix. So this this crystal structure. And notice you have these, the chloride, they're the, the negative ions. And then the purple ones here, that's the sodium. And notice that the, the sodiums are always next to the chlorine, chlorides. And uh, so there is attraction between the unlike charges, but there's repulsion here. Like there's all these repulsive forces between the like charges. And then there is also repulsion here between the, um, the, the positive ions as well. But if you, this would be a very boring class, but we could sit down and, you know, if we had, if we measured things out, uh, you could look at the attraction between these two centers and then the repulsion between the diagonals. And you add all the attractions, subtract all the repulsions, uh, and uh, just do it over and over again. And you can calculate very easily ionic bonds. You know, like I said, just Pythagorean theorem and Coulomb's law. Question. Um, I thought you said that uh, the atomic radius of an atom is smaller the closer it is to the right. Okay. Uh, these are ions. It's so if you if you look at sodium metal, when you have sodium metal, when you rip off an electron, what happens? It, it shrinks. And then chlorine, when it absorbs an electron, it blows up. So whenever you add electric, whenever you add a negative charge to anything, it gets big. And when you add positive charge to something, it shrinks. So same thing with with uh, biological surfaces. So you add negative charge to things, they they get big. When you add positive charge to surfaces, they shrink. Or, or well, to anything biological. It's also how fabric softeners work. Actually, you add positive charge. So, yes, uh, and uh, of course, ionic bonding can be more complicated. Um, you can remove atoms. So say you have like missing atoms in there and, and then that changes the bonding a little bit. But I mean, all in all, it's just Pythagorean theorem and Coulomb's law, right? So, uh, and there are certain shortcuts. So uh, you can, uh, later on, if you go to classes, there's something called the Madelong constant they take certain crystal structures and they just sum up all the geometry, do the calculations, and then you just use the battle on constant 
and then and then that way it, it just makes the math a lot easier so you don't have to worry about that until your junior year if you're a chemistry major or i don't know uh, about physics you I, I i was a chem well i wasn't a chemistry major i was a chemical engineering major but we studied it because i had a chemistry minor um they might talk about that in solid state physics i don't know i only uh i only studied solid state physics when it, as it pertains to lasers okay uh all right and and then you said metallic bonding so is the easiest i in my opinion metallic bonding is the second easiest so you can probably see where this is going covalent bonding is the hardest and it's the hardest by far metallic bonding actually can be pretty easy uh you need a little more complicated math than uh than than um the ionic bonding because ionic bonding like i said is just pythagorean theorem and coulomb's law metallic bonding you need a little bit of quantum mechanics uh, but it's real easy to model metals. So uh, if you do calculations, you can do something called the local density approximation, the LDA. And, and it, uh, what the LDA does is it, it, it assumes an electron is just this uniform gas. And when you put that approximation, you can get almost everything uh, sorted with metallic bonding. So we can we can model metallic bonding very, very well. So it's it's not that hard. It's it's beyond this class because uh, it does involve quantum mechanics, but it's it's something it's a it's a pretty easy uh, solution. So it's not it's not very difficult and you don't have many, many different solutions and that kind of stuff. So metallic bonding is pretty easy and and uh, like with our models it, it works out pretty well uh, the idea is that you you have a bunch of positive centers just these are atoms and they're positive centers and then you have there's a different color then you have electrons flowing between the positive centers and that makes uh and that and the that type of bonding and it's uh, explains their physical properties too of metals and ionic bonding. So that's one thing that's cool about chemistry is that the uh, like the microscopic microscopic stuff, I guess maybe even pico or nanoscopic stuff, I should say with, with atoms. So the pico spot 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 microscopic picoscopic uh, stuff mimics what's going on with the bulk material so with ionic bonding so let me let me make it uh two-dimensional so ionic bonds tend to be very uh hard so here is like a two-dimensional ionic compound what happens if i smash this with a hammer and then i move everything down by one atom what's going to happen Yep, breaks apart because now we have the repulsion. And then here with uh, metallic bonding, we have the positive centers with the sea of electrons. What happens if I smack it with a hammer and then I move it down by one atom? What happens to the bonding? Yeah, absolutely nothing. You've just deformed the metal, right? And we know, that, and this makes sense, right? So what, what happens when, and most rocks are ionic bonds, what happens when you hit rocks with hammers? They, you know, break. They break in powder eyes or salt. If you take salt and you hit it with a hammer, it turns into dust. What happens if you take a piece of metal and you smack it with a hammer? You get a piece of metal with a image of a hammerhead on it, right? It's bends. And that explains why metals are ductile. You can take them and bend them and stuff. And, and ionic compounds, they're not so bendy. They just, they kind of, they're brittle. You, you push on them and they're pretty, they're hard, they're strong, and then they, they break. So, cause you're breaking that, uh, you're breaking this, this bond, this, these bonding, oops. This, this bond right here. And then we get to covalent bonding. Like I said, it's really hard. Uh, and we'll talk about this quite a bit. So from between, uh, not too much today, but uh, on Wednesday on through Thanksgiving, not quite till Christmas, we'll talk about a lot about covalent bonding. 
So, and that's a sharing of electrons or in the case of water, unequal sharing of electrons. So how are we doing so far, questions? So we'll start a little bit with, with uh, ionic bonding. And uh, the first thing we're gonna come up with this sort of fictitious thing we call lattice energy. So if you look here at sodium chloride, uh, if you, in making sodium chloride, you, you take electrons away from sodium and you give it to chlorine. And uh, for a lot of times, actually, when you do that, it's, it's believe it or not, it's exothermic. It, I'm, I'm sorry, it's endothermic. It's endothermic. It takes energy to do that. Uh, so, uh, but then what happens though, is that when these ions all coalesce and form this ionic compound matrix, by matrix, I mean like the array of atoms and where they're positioned, not like Neo and he's the one. Are you guys into the matrix at all or am I too old? So well, the, the fourth movie is coming out soon. So I'm excited about that. But so when, when you bring all of these ions down to form that, that solid uh, network, uh, well, it's not a network. It's it's the this, the solid the the matrix. It's uh it this whole process is extremely, extremely exothermic. And uh, the thing is though, like, uh, it's going to be a pain to calculate this. I mean, we can calculate it, but uh, I mean, you have to sum up all those attractions, all those repulsions. And we've done it, and it's and like I said, we, we already have a shortcut. Like I told you about that, we we have a shortcut coming up. Uh, if you study more chemistry, there's a shortcut to it as well. But that's a pain. Uh, but what we can do? Do you remember when we talked about um, energy? So like uh, and and like delta, where we have the the delta E and the delta H, and I say that they're path independent. So they we we uh, it doesn't matter what path we take we'll get the same answer. And so from the fact that these are path independent, we can make up this sort of weird way of doing something and then use the unknown information to figure out what this, and this, the energy that's released when this forms, this is known as the lattice energy. So we can, we can figure out the lattice energy. And uh, as a side note, uh, I think this is kind of cool, I guess, partly because I, you probably know um, I have a my own personal interest in astronomy for various reasons. Uh, so when planets coalesce and form, um, they they form because of gravity, right? So, and and I remember going to a talk and we were to, if you guys do you guys like Star Wars? Did, did you if you know the the Death Star in the original Star Wars blew up a planet, and how much energy it would take to blow up a planet? And the, the speaker was like, "This is a terrible idea. This is a waste of money, waste of energy." Because he said the amount of energy it would take to blow up a planet and showed that like if you take like a brick sized piece of material, you take two bricks together, they coalesce because of gravity. And if you take the number of bricks that would make an Earth sized planet, you bring them down and go in the gravity well. And he said, this is how much energy it would take. It was some huge number. So I'm like, why would you waste all that energy to blow up a planet? You don't, you can, when you could do, so you could throw an asteroid at it and just blow up the surface that way. So. So same idea with coalescing planets. Uh, so you're also doing that to coalesce a salt crystal. Okay, but let's talk about this energy. And I told you it's path independent. So from that, we can start, I guess I'll start the step-by-step. Step. So the initial step is the beginning. So you have sodium metal and chlorine gas. I know it's one half chlorine gas just to make the, uh, the numbers easier. So half a chlorine. And so how do we get to making about well then this is the overall reaction. So and and so sodium sodium metal plus half of a chlorine molecule makes sodium chloride. And it's uh, very exothermic and we can measure it. I, I showed you the video. You guys want to see the, the formation of it again? I showed you that. Oh I'll go ahead and show it to you. What the heck? Here is, is it sodium? No, okay, it's gonna be chlorine, here we go. So here is, that's Theodore Gray. He's got, there's liquids, there's metallic sodium. He's adding activation energy. Now he's turning on the chlorine gas. 
and it's very ex you can see it's very exothermic it's doing that and it's he's making sodium chloride salt and then he goes and he's going to take his eggs and and salt his eggs that way because he's he's a nut so he's he's salting his eggs using the sodium chloride yeah this guy this guy's insane but in a in a mad in a in like a mad scientist sort of a way he's like like the mad scientist that you want as your friend sort of a way he's very charming i've never met him but i've seen interviews and i own uh at least three of his ebooks so anyway so that's the this is the overall reaction which you've seen and you can and we can it's obviously very exothermic and it's also the heat of formation of sodium chloride so we know that so let's let's go the other way uh so uh, let's take sodium solid and let's vaporize it to form sodium gas. So you can see here, we start off with, with sodium metal and chlorine gas. Now going here, we, we uh, went ahead and that's an arrow. We went ahead and, and made it into uh, sodium metal vapor. And now the next thing we're going to do, we're going to rip apart chlorine. So we have a diatomic chlorine, and we've ripped apart chlorine to form chloride. And, and uh, you can see here the, the potential energy, it's going up. It takes energy to, to vaporize sodium. It takes energy to break apart uh, chlorine. And likewise, it takes energy to rip an electron off of sodium. So from here, here to here, sodium has gone from sodium metal to sodium ion. So it takes energy to rip elect off electrons. And it turns out that the electron affinity for chlorine, chlorine radical, uh, chlorine radical meaning the just the the un unpaired electron. Sorry, I even learned what a radical is yet. Cl gas absorbing an electron is is exothermic. So this is the electron affinity of chlorine. And it goes down in energy. And so for the next step here, we have sodium metal ion, uh, I'm sorry, no, it's not metal, sorry. Sodium ion vapor and chloride ion vapor. And then we're gonna turn these vapors into sodium chloride. This is the same thing as this step here, right? You have sodium ion vapor and chloride ion vapor, and you go and you form salt so we call this step the lattice energy and uh we also know so let's let's call this so uh well our delta h the delta the overall reaction so this this overall reaction right here this equals, so this step right here, this is step one, if you can see the numbers here. Here we have, I'll change colors. We have step one, that's the, uh, so vaporizing sodium. Step two, breaking apart chlorine. Step three, ionizing the uh, sodium. Step four, electron affinity of chlorine. And step five, the lattice energy, all those, all those steps together equals the delta H, the heat of formation of, of uh, sodium chloride. So it's this delta H is step one through five summed together. So if I, uh, and just one equation, one unknown, if I know the delta H formation of sodium chloride, which is very well known, and if I know the uh, the vape the uh, the vaporization, so it would be the melting point and the boiling point, or say the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization of sodium, or the heat of sublimation, which would be the same thing. We can we can figure that this step out. Uh, so going in step one, uh, then step two, uh, the first ionization energy of sodium. That's that's step uh, two. Step three, 
um, actually, no, wait, step one is, so, uh, sorry, sublimation of step two is, I'm sorry, step, step two is, is uh, chlorine ripping apart. That's step two, that's pretty easy to figure out. Step three is uh, uh, ionization energy of sodium. Step four is electron affinity of chlorine. And step five, this is our unknown. We don't know step five. So we can solve for step five. Step five is the overall reaction minus steps one through four. So, and this is known, this right here is known as the um, Born-Haber process. So, uh, and uh, you'll see some of the things in the, in the book about that. Uh, then, so let's talk about ionization energy and let's talk about the trends. And uh, so if you look at Coulomb's law, and I mentioned Coulomb's law before, charge of one, the, the, the attractive force is the charge of one, charge of second over the distance squared times a constant. So uh, looking at that, uh, what do you think is going to be more important, the charge or the distance? My answer is they're both important, but charge. Yes, it's the charge. Charge is more important. So let's look at the alkalis. So these are alkali chlorides. So uh, if you look at the distance, so the, the distance between the atomic centers in lithium chloride is 241 picometers, and then goes up to cesium chloride at 348 picometers. So the, this, the distance doesn't change that much. So what you'd expect is that the lattice energy would be strongest for lithium chloride because it's got a smaller distance. And so, right, so where the, the force is proportional to the charge of one charge a second over the distance squared. So uh, from this, you would think the closer the bond, the stronger it's going to be. And that's exactly what you see. Right, you can see the lithium chloride is in fact bigger than cesium chloride. Not surprising, but it goes from 800 to 600. But then when you compare, so let's compare uh, two similarly sized ions. So sodium fluoride, the stuff they put in toothpaste. So the atomic distance between these two is 231 picometers and calcium oxide is gonna be 239. So they're close close-ish. And then when you compare the lattice energies, you see that the lattice energy for sodium fluoride is 900, negative 910 exothermic, and calcium oxide is minus 3,414. So, uh, and this is not surprising, right? Because if you, if you look at the uh, Coulomb's law, so it's going to be plus one minus one, I should say, I should go ahead and it's gonna be plus one minus one over the same distance squared. And if you have plus two minus two over the same distance squared, you would expect this one to be, uh, so plus one times minus one gives you minus one, plus, plus two times minus two gives you minus four. And you can see here that, it, that calcium oxide is about four times because nine times four is 36, right? So calcium oxide is, is a little less than four times uh, as powerful lattice energy as sodium fluoride. And why is it not exactly four times? Because the distance, right? You see here, this is 239 picometers. So the distance for calcium oxide is slightly longer. So then this R1 squared term is gonna be a little larger. So it's gonna be, I should, well, I had circled the wrong one. It's gonna be this one, this, that, that R12 squared is gonna be a little larger than it is for sodium fluoride. So that's the reason why calcium oxide is a little less than, than four times that, but it's about four. So it's, it's close-ish. But I think it, it illustrates the point though, right? So the point is that, uh, okay, so what, what makes uh, something have a, a higher lattice energy? 
it's going to be shorter distance and higher charge. And of the two, what's more important, distance or charge? Charge. So, so arrange these compounds and increasing magnitude of lattice energy. That means from low to high. So low to high. And if you look at calcium oxide, that's going to be plus two, minus two. Calcium is an alkyl inert, right? An oxygen. I'm getting this from the periodic table. Hopefully you're all pros of the periodic table. Calcium is here. Calcium here is here. That's going to be plus two. Oxygen here is minus two. So calcium oxide plus two, minus two. Potassium is an alkali. That's plus one. Bromine is a uh, halogen. It's minus one. Potassium already alkali, chloride, halogen. Strontium is an alkali on earth plus two. Oxygen already, oops, minus two. So, okay. Uh, which means the low ones are going to be the plus one minus ones, and they can be KBr and KCl, and the high ones are going to be calcium oxide and strontium oxide. So now we have to decide between them which one is lower energy, KBr, calcium, potassium bromide, or potassium chloride. So again, we go to the periodic table. And we look at chlorine and bromine. So chlorine is a smaller atom and bromine below it is a larger atom, which also means then that bromide is gonna be big. So this one's gonna be big and this one's gonna be small. So the smaller one is closer. So this one here, so KCl has a higher uh, lattice energy. So the smallest one is gonna be KBr. And then the next biggest one is going to be KCl. Now, the same idea with calcium and, and strontium. So here's calcium, here's strontium. Strontium is lower, it's bigger, it's going to be weaker. Or calcium is smaller, it's going to be stronger as far as the distance. So the next one here is going to be strontium oxide. And then calcium oxide is going to be the biggest. Does this make sense? So you go start off with a charge. The plus one minus one is going to be lower energy than the plus two minus two. Now to compare the ones that are plus one minus one, we have to compare the size of the different ions. It's nice that the counter ion is the same for both, right? So they're both potassium. So have to pick between bromine and, and chlorine. Bromine is lower on the pair table. It's going to be a bigger uh, atom, bigger ion. So the bigger one is the weakest because it's been the longest distance that so goes first. And then, then comes KCl, and then we compare it to the plus two minus twos. Strontium is below calcium, therefore it's bigger. Therefore, the bigger one is going to be the weaker one. It goes next, and then calcium is the is the grand winner of the highest energy contest here. So, so. Are the charge is always going to be one point in the, the distance. It's Looking at the equation uh, with the range of, um, of the atoms, uh, I believe so. I can't think of an example where it wouldn't be off the top of my head. But usually, you have to, if the charge is higher, then you're automatically going to put it. Yeah. Yeah, if it's the same charge, then you got to gotta start looking a little more closely, start using more logic. Other questions? Okay, and so ionic compounds. Uh, let me talk about what some of the uses of ionic compounds are. So we use them sometimes in medicine. Uh, silver nitrates. So um, the silver, actually silver in general, is just really good at at killing things. I mean, we showed the remember we showed the Smurf guy. Um, colloidal silver. He ate a lot of colloidal silver, and he turned blue. Um, but silver, silver kills stuff. Actually, all of the uh, silver, copper, silver, gold, they're great antimicrobial agents. Uh, one of the things people thought about doing is, is using, um, having copper door handles, door handles, because then they'll be naturally uh, antiseptic. So that way it'll, it'll just, it'll self-clean itself. Anything, living things just die on, on copper, uh, silver. What's that? Um, 
Well, I mean, thing is like when you sit down, it's not very often that you that you take that part of your body, you know, usually you don't use that part of your body for other things. You know, whereas your hands though, you 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 typically don't put your bottom where you put your mouth, right? <clears throat> kind of thing. I mean, I know, I know, I know, open mind. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, but but whereas majority of the population does in fact, you know, take things and then put it in there and then and then touching and jest, right? So uh, also not only that, touching and then you know rubbing your eyes. Do they not if they get those copper because it requires expensive? No, it's expensive. It also turns things green. That's good. Money. Happy to be a teacher. Yeah, fair enough. Yes. So uh but where they where they have thought about, although you mentioned this the toilet seats, uh where where they they do make things out of silver is in uh, special forces and astronaut undergarments. So uh, if you're gonna be like deployed for a while and not have access to a washing machine, or if you're in space and you don't want things growing on, on you in that area, if you have silver mesh and clothing, it prevents that type of growth. So I guess, I guess that is one uh, application that you would use that, that, is that for. But anyways, uh, silver nitrate, though, the silver ions also are my term, not just the metal, but the ions as well. And uh, they use it for a lot of things uh, for eye infections, especially for, for newborns. And there's some there's some band-aids they say it has has silver in them. The problem, though, with it is if you have silver plus sunlight, silver nitrate plus sunlight, it turns your skin brown. So, I mean, well, someone. I'm, I'm the fairest member of the, the classroom right now. It turns my skin really brown. So uh, some people, of course, it won't really matter because you have enough melanin in your skin, but uh, it, it, it takes, it tends to turn people's skin brown. So, uh, but okay. And uh, barium sulfate, um, I've had this done. Um, CT scans of the, the digestive tract. So CT is computer like computational topography it uses X-ray. So uh, barium is really good at uh, scattering X-rays. So you can use it as a contrast to find where your where where your intestines are, your stomach and intestines, and they use the image uh, your GI tract. And uh, also iodine. Do they, oh, we don't have iodide in there. Um, okay, we don't have. Okay, uh, iodide is another one uh, for that. Uh, so I don't, you don't have to ask this. Has anyone ever had done that before? I, I've done it twice, actually, at the CT scan with the barium. Nope. So what about with the iodine? Anyone ever had the iodide and, and then the CT scan? Or you guys are too young to start having surgeries? So CT, did you, did you have an injection? Did they, did they hook up a, uh, a IV drip to you? Uh, yeah, okay, that was iodine. Did it make you feel bad, hot, or like I did? I, I'm lucky. I don't feel anything with iodine. A lot, most people feel hot or feel like they have to pee, but I just, it doesn't bother me one bit. But, which is okay. But, anyways, all the, both of those things they use them for as a contrasting agent for x rays. So, uh, and, and calcium sulfate, uh, we don't do this as much anymore. Uh, use it to make plaster casts. But um, you can use this, and we use this a lot in art, though. Um, does anyone ever take a sculpting class before? Did you do the last mat, lost wax method? Oh, you didn't do that? Okay. Did you, okay. No, you, um, did you make, they call it an invest, did you ever make a, a wax sculpture first? And then, oh, you did that? Yeah. Did you make the investment? Okay. 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 I've done ceramic. How do you do ceramic? Do you, you make the? Do you make you make wax first? Well, if you, like when you're first beginning, they'll give you like the fake clay or like the wax thing. It's like there's different things that you can use. I think they're like a fake clay. So you can do like different shapes. You can start with that first. You can do like a paint, and then the last one. Oh, okay. Also, it's practice, not okay. 
There's something called the lost wax method. It's like how Rodin, you guys ever seen Rodin? Like the, the thinker or mm. gates of the, the gates of hell. Are you familiar with that? Thinker is the main guy going like this, right? You, so he did this. Um, like so to make the sculpture, um, they take wax and you make you make the you know whatever it is you want to you want to make a thinker you know that kind of thing uh, or you can use a mold but then you put wax in the mold then uh, you take you make an irrigation system you put wax all the way around it and then you you take um, like a chicken wire like like the uh, like the metal fencing and you you put like a like a kind of like a ring around the sculpture. And then you you take plaster, so um, you so it's it's magnesium sulfate, and I'm or I'm sorry calcium sulfate, and and then you you mix that with water, and then it becomes calcium sulfate. I, th I think it's dec I think it's ten hydrate. It gets really hot. You mix it up, it gets really hot. You mix that with sand, and you pour it into your chicken wire cage, and you let it sit for a while. That's called your investment. And then because you've, you've already put a wax irrigation system, you flip it upside down, you throw it into a kiln, and you heat it for like overnight kind of thing. And so then all the wax drips out. Now you have like this, this um, plaster thing that has all the tubes and your sculpture. And then you pour molten bronze into your investment. And then you get like your, your bronze statue with all the tubes sticking out. Then, then you take a, a sledgehammer or an axe and you just beat the heck out of it and you break out all the rocks and it's, it's plaster so it's not too hard. So but it's fun, it's fun to sit there and whack it with a, with a hammer. Uh, then, then you, then, so then you have your piece of bronze with all the tubes sticking out. Then you cut off all the, the bronze and then you polish it and you have your sculpture. So that's, that's how you, and then you can do the patina which is the, 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 the top surface. So that was a fun class. Sometimes I, I, uh, I, I think about you students, you know, like, I mean, you can take chemistry to three credit class, or you can take, you know, bronze sculpting, because I get free tuition as well. So, you know, I got the, the free class and, and I was like, man, I hope my chemistry students don't find out in this class. It was so much, it was so much fun to pour molten bronze, you know, it was dangerous. It was really, really dangerous. But I mean, you know, that was fun though. So they I'm like here? They had a Manoa. Oh, okay. Yeah, they don't have that. Here we have ceramics here. Oh, we're losing. Oh no, we lost a student. He's probably gonna go take uh ceramics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Screw chemistry. I'm gonna make my investment. So uh, but my point is, I mean, you like you're using these things and other things. It's not it, chemistry, you know, is a very practical thing to learn. So Make plaster. We don't make plaster casting. Oh, stuff gets hot. I um, I was a I was a a model for a sculpture one time, and they um, I was cast in in plaster, and and they they have like, uh, these fiberglass strips of plaster on them, and you um, and you you get them wet, and it gets hot, and they you know they they put it all over like my arms and whatnot, and and like. That stuff gets hot. It wasn't burning hot, but it was it was hot. It's warm. I mean, of course, nowadays our casts they're either plastic, like the air cast, or they're or they're fiberglass. So we don't use plaster casts anymore. But we still we still do this in art, though. And uh, potassium permanganate, purple stuff. This stuff is uh, is interesting. Uh, so used a, as a fungal infections, especially in World War One. There's this thing, something called trench foot. So people were in the trenches and they just, you know, around all that muck and stuff in their boots and they just got stuff in their boots. And then they had, basically everyone got really bad athlete's foot, you know, fungal infections. That's one of the ways they treated it. They used potassium permanganate. Uh, you can use this to purify water. Uh, have you ever seen, I like some of those survival shows. It's one of my guilty pleasures. Do you guys ever watch Alone or Naked and Afraid? Am I the only one? Yeah. I've seen it, yeah. I like alone better, but uh, I remember in Naked and Afraid, uh, one of the people, you can bring one item in that show and someone brought potassium permanganate 
as, as her uh, one item to bring from society because you can use it to, to sterilize things. So uh, it is potassium permanganate, it's purple stuff, as I mentioned. It's, um, it's really, it's a, it's a pretty strong reagent. Uh, if you, so like a piece of wood or this textbook, if I took its purple crystals, if I put the purple crystals on this textbook and let it sit, it would catch on fire. So really, really reactive. Of course, the, the solution though is diluted. I mean, they're not gonna put the purple stuff, you know, I mean, it's a powder that it's gonna be mixed with talc, uh, but, it, but like the, um, the, like the solutions that they use, it's, it's diluted. So it's not, it's not gonna catch your, your skin on fire. So, um, and potassium iodide. So this is gonna be used in antiseptic uh, and you can actually taste it. I, I can, do you guys notice that in, in certain um, like drinking fountains or, or like soda machines? Do you ever get that, that taste of iodine? I can, I can taste it at least. So. I don't know. I mean, it tastes like, yeah, it tastes like iodine, I don't know. <laughs> How do I describe it? Um, you ever drank water from like a, a soda fountain before, like an airport or a restaurant, and it has this kind of, it's not quite salty, but kind of a tangy sort of flavor. It's not quite like bleach, but it's. <laughs> yeah, it's so bleach. I don't, I mean, well, I mean, the swimming pools use chlorine, right? So you know what chlorine smells like? Yeah. It tastes like chlorine, right? Yeah. Wasn't that what? Oh, you know what the pool tastes like, right? Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully? Yeah. Well, we, we, put, <laughs> yeah. we have chlorine in the water here, not very much, but now we actually chlorinate the water. But um, I don't know. It's I because uh, fluorine kind of smells like chlorine, but it smells different than chlorine. But I mean, I iodine is going to taste kind of like chlorine, but you know, but not it's going to be a little different. I don't know. It has a little. Tangier metallic flavor, but it's not the same as bleach. You know, what? I think I think so. You know, uh, although generally I thought that they actually put chlorine in the water. Some people do put. Is they do. Don't they? They in most places they don't on Oahu. Um, they do here. They, they put they put chlorine in the water. Yeah. Oh, okay, so that maybe it is yeah. chlorine and maybe the iodine. Yeah. I don't know. I, there's I, a there's a problem um, in the California reservoir. They plant chlorine in the middle of everything in the sun. And it, the sun made it react in the water more. It was actually like, um, like um, toxic for the people. Okay, yeah, because could could react with, with organic molecules to make some. I can do they they can do that, but that that can't happen. That happens a lot in waste water, because when they, and because uh, secondary treatment, they put activated sludge into into water treatment plants, and and it eats a lot of things. And then of course, activated sludge is biological. So then you have to kill it. An easy way to kill it is chlorine, but then the chlorine can react with the organic molecules. So yeah, that's, that's very well known, understood as possible. So. Why do you put chlorine at all? Then we have a good drinking water from. That's, that's wastewater. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean why chlorine here? Yeah because we don't want to test the water for microbials. So the- um, They just put it through a process. Anyway. Yeah, they, they are saving money by, rather than checking it every time to make sure it's within safe parameters, they're just saying, just gonna kill it all. Yeah, because they, they, they tell me not to drink the water that has like the preceded, like the tap water, like don't do that. It's like a no thing. Not really? On the other side, but the Lahaina does that. Oh. I I lived in Kula. I always drank the water. I live in Waikiki now, but I don't know. The thing I have a newer house, though. My the water in my house for a couple of years tasted like hose water, so I just filtered it. I love hose water. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, so I, I use a filter just because I don't like the flavor. What we don't have here in in Hawaii is we don't have fluorine in our water. But uh, anyways, um. Yeah, iodine is used to sterilize. Also, milk used to sterilize, um, like, like um, cow equipment. You know, like the stuff that they put on the udders to draw out the milk. The automatic milking machines. So, uh, how do you know this? Well, uh, for people that um, 
So iodine goes to your thyroid gland, which is right around here. It, um, your thyroid is, is uh, it generates thyroxin, uh, which, which is, um, it sets your, your body's idle. It's, it's your metabolism. So uh, like right when you turn on your car, your car has an idle. And the, the amount, the, how much your car idles is similar to your body's metabolism. So if you have a higher metabolism, you just are burning more energy kind of thing. So, uh, and some people that have issues with uh, their thyroid, so things like uh, Hashimoto's or Gray's disease, or if they want to have it imaged, you have to have, uh, you can use radioactive iodine to kill it and or to image it. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the things you have to do though, before that you have to go on an iodine-free diet, which basically means fruit, no salt and, and beef or and meat. So it's like meat and fruit and vegetables is a low iodine diet. Um, so you can't have any milk because milk they use quite a bit of iodine for sterilization. And um, also uh, potassium iodide. Uh, let's see here. I guess almost 10 years ago. Geez, where the time goes. So do you remember the Fukushima event when all that and people went and bought a bunch of potassium iodide? Um, I actually, I wrote an article for the um, Star Advertiser and I, I, I got hate mail around the country for this, I remember. I, uh, so uh, I was, people were buying all this potassium iodide, people were like, oh, we need potassium iodide. And one of the things I said is like, look, like we, um, we detonated 500 nuclear weapons in the atmosphere back in the 50s and 60s, and the amount of radiation released in one nuclear weapon is way more than it's being released from Fukushima. So you're fine. And then I'm like, everything's fine. The food system is fine. Continue to eat food and eat the crops. It's all good. And then actually, apparently, the thing that I that apparently I pissed people off was when I said that the food sources are fine here in the United States. I got hate mail from around the nation about that. So yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, a lot of people are like, oh, we didn't think about the nuclear program. But anyways, um, if you, like they did this with Fukushima uh, and we, we stockpile potassium iodide as part of our uh, nuclear defense. So uh, if you, you guys ever watched Chernobyl, the miniseries that came out? Uh, if you remember, they, they gave iodine to some people. The, um, the, so uh, one of the byproducts of a nuclear reaction is iodine-131, it's radioactive, and it goes right to your thyroid. And if you take it, you can avoid that. So if you look at the people around Chernobyl, a lot of them got, uh, had thyroid problems after exposure to it. Um, although I, I, I wonder about this, uh, and iodine is actually, uh, it's, it's one of those moderation arguments. Iodine is a mineral. So it's, a, it's an element that our body needs. So you, you know what vitamins and minerals are. So vitamins are organic molecules that we need in small quantities. Organic meaning carbon containing. Minerals are elements that our body needs in small quantities. So, or just, I guess, in just general needs. So we, we need quite a bit of phosphorus and calcium, for instance. We also need iron, right? So, but iodine is a mineral. We need a small amount of it. If you have too much iodine, you get a condition called iodism, where you get lethargic and, and just kind of slow and sluggish. If you have too little, you can get a, a goiter where your thyroid expands and you, your metabolism goes down. So that, that is the, you know, the Goldilocks moderation argument. You need to have E just right. So the solution to radiation sickness isn't like, I'm going to always take lots and lots of iodine all the time in case, you know, a nuclear weapon goes off. No, that's not, you'll get iodism. So, uh, but if they're, say you're in Japan and a nuclear reactor blows up and they say, take this pill, you should probably take the pill. Or if a nuclear bomb goes off and, you know, a bunch of people in army fatigue say, take this pill, they're giving you potassium iodide. So it's uh, the idea is you you put a you you saturate your thyroid with iodine so that way you can't uptake anymore. So, anyways, well, scary stuff.
But did you, uh, were you guys here for when they had the nuclear missile scare? That was, that was pretty scary. My mom was there. Yeah. Yeah, I remember it was interesting because um, like uh, President Lasner, he sent an email saying like, everyone, you should prepare for a nuclear event. So I actually, I prepared for it. And um, I, I think I told you I used to be a nuclear scientist. And so I was actually all prepped and I, I said, okay, I, I talked to my wife. I'm like, here's our plan. We're staying in, in Kula. And we like, I was like, let's go to the most central room of the house because we need to get much distance between us and any potential, you know, explosion. And let's fill the bathtub full of water and we should probably put them out on the floor. And uh, it's like, the best thing we can do is cover ourselves with a wet blanket because that would protect from radiation and heat. And uh, so then when we got the alert, I remember uh, I came back from a jog and then my wife like, what is this? I'm like, I'm like, oh, it's like, like, is this a joke? I'm like, nope, let's take it seriously. So I sat at my, you know, like my survival, you know, bunker. I didn't do the wet blanket though. I just grabbed a quilt partially because I didn't want to get it wet. I didn't really think that we would get hit though directly. Yeah, they'd only hit Maui as they missed because Maui was not a very good military target. So, but uh, I was, what I was more worried about was the fallout. Anyways, I, so I, you know, so my wife and I are just in the bathroom on the floor on a mat and, you know, covered in a quilt. And I was telling her, keep her mouth open because it, because like um, if the blast comes, it can rupture your eardrums. So keep your, so that's what you should do. If you're, if you're ever worried about a bomb going off, keep your, keep your mouth open and um, put as much as, uh, at least for a nuclear uh, event, put as much material, just matter between you and anything as you can. So uh, similar to actually uh, any, any bomb going off though, um, if you go on the ground and keep your mouth open and turn your head, line your stomach, that'll work for most any circumstance if you're wondering. But the mouth open is, is key because otherwise you'll, you know, I mean, rupture your eardrums. But if you're Indiana Jones, you mean? Depends on how close you are um to the to the blast because uh for a nuclear blast you need you need a couple feet of lead um so if you're if you're within 10 miles of the blast that's that's a maybe if you're if you're more than 10 miles away from a nuclear blast that's not going to harm you at least from the initial initial um not the fallout the fallout's pretty deadly but the uh, the initial gamma burst. So I guess it depends if he's if Indiana Jones was far enough from it, a lead lined refrigerator could have protected it. So, but if it was more than ten miles, it wouldn't matter. Okay, and lithium carbonate. Oh, we should we're talking about music. You heard the Nirvana song Lithium. So lithium carbonate. Uh, this is one of the first treatments for um, bipolar. So, uh, and it's a mood stabilizer. So lithium carbonate, I think it was the first one, is a, is a mood stabilizer, um, meaning depending on the type of uh, bipolar, moods can go up and down, especially manic depressive where you're like, you're manic, you're really, really happy, and then you have longer periods of depressive. So instead of having your moods go up and down, actually it's more high for a little bit and low for a long period of time, kind of evens your emotions out. So that's, uh, and there's, there's other drugs now as well, but that's one of the first ones. Uh, magnesium sulfate. Oh, this is Epsom salts. You guys did a lab on Epsom salts. So I use it more for soaking my feet. Um, but it can also, oh, well, and, and generally speaking, uh, magnesium, magnesium is a laxative. So magnesium sulfate you can use as a, um, as a laxative. You can use magnesium citrate or magnesium hydroxide. Magnesium, the, both magnesium citrate and magnesium hydroxide can be um, used as antacids and also as laxatives. So be careful if you, if you do consume magnesium. Because it might increase, it, it might increase your 
your your flow, if you will. Um, so, uh, and it can be used to treat eclampsia. So that's during pregnancy. So, oh, magnesium hydroxide. I already mentioned that. Uh, so, it's a an acid and laxative. And sodium bicarbonate. So this is baking soda. So uh, it used to be used to treat um, uh, stomach acid, uh, too much stomach acid. But now um, we you typically use calcium carbonate. That's Tums. Either calcium or magnesium hydroxide or calcium carbonate is used for that. That's uh, to uh, relieve stomach stomach what too much acid in your stomach stomach. And uh, they can inject this into you. Has anyone ever had acidosis? I have. I'm a lucky duck here. Um, I was around uh, the volcano around Kilauea, and, uh, and it erupted, um, and and I breathed in too much sulfur, and I ended up getting a mild case of acidosis, and it's very, very uncomfortable. In case you were wondering, um, I didn't require hospitalization. I didn't, they didn't do any of that, but just I thought I was going to pass out. So the world got kind of wavy and it's closing in on me. Yep. So, but uh, acidosis, um, like uh, you can, uh, they can inject the, 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 the so, sorry, sodium bicarbonate into you and you can get your, your blood pH will go back up. So it's, it's alkaline. Um, I actually use uh, sodium bicarbonate. Uh, I use it uh, with toothpaste. So uh, I use also below that sodium fluoride uh, used to strengthen teeth. So uh, my dentist told me to do this a while ago. Uh, so for fluoride and toothpaste, there usually is either sodium fluoride or uh, tin fluoride. So I prefer sodium fluoride over tin fluoride myself. Uh, yeah, question. Oh, for your acidosis, could you eat toothpaste and then get better? Yeah, you could. Um, it, it has other issues. Uh, so it wouldn't be as fast, and the injection would be much faster. Injected taste, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, would, that would be painful. Um, that probably wouldn't do very much other than maybe kill you. Um, so yeah, because if you, if you get a lot of your stomach, like if you eat a lot of um, like acids, I mean, it's, it's a slower process, but yeah, it will bring your your blood pH up over time, but the, the injection of the bicarbonate would be, you know, done quickly. Um, but uh, I guess also, I guess I talk a little more about how we do time, three minutes. I don't have time to talk about that. I'm gonna talk about the different ways to lower stomach acid, but that'd be for another day. Uh, sodium fluoride, the, well, for, for toothpaste, um, so sodium fluoride is actually also antimicrobial. But your teeth are made, uh, I guess we, so you smile. Your teeth are made of a mineral called hydroxyalpatite. It's uh, calcium, phosphorus, and hydroxides. Fluoride replaces the hydroxides and it makes your tooth enamel harder and it makes it less soluble. So it's harder, your, your tooth enamel can dissolve in acid and Meaning like, um, but your, your teeth also remineralize. So we, we, we replace our, our tooth enamel as well. But um, uh, like when you eat food and the bacteria come and they eat it, they release acids and that, that can cause tooth, it just dissolves your teeth. So uh, fluoride makes it harder for your teeth to dissolve and uh, also kills bacteria. So, but uh, I add baking soda to my toothpaste uh, because it also, uh, this is more on the cutting edge. We don't understand a lot of things, but your microbiome, have you heard of your microbiome, your, your symbiotic relationship you have with bacteria? If you have more alkaline uh, environment in your mouth, it promotes a more healthy microbiome or so we think. And so I've been doing that. And actually it's, I think it's helped my, my oral health. Like, so whenever I go to the dentist, they're like, wow, you have great, you know, they always compliment me. So, and, and the only thing I did differently besides, I mean, I've always, I've always been careful, but I always, you know, I, I brush my teeth with, uh, with baking soda and, and Floyd. Uh, the other thing is you don't need that much um, for, for toothpaste. 
you only need about a, a pea-sized amount. If you see the commercials, they like put big globs of it. That's too much. Uh, you just need a really small amount. And and I just put that. I put baking soda on. And I brush my feet that way. So, and uh, it's been working for me. Uh, and okay, last one: zinc oxide. Uh, so can you? And titanium dioxide too is another one. Is a uh, for for blocking the sun. So. Uh, and so that's what we use some of the ionic compounds for, for, at least for medical uses, although I threw art in there for as well. Uh, I was going to talk about stomach acid. You can also uh, decrease stomach acid by using H2 blocks or blockers or proton pump inhibitors. So that's what I was going to say, but I know we got one minute left. So anybody have any quick questions while we have 15 seconds of class left? Nope. No questions. All right. How long is it? Little, little more than 14, a little less than 16. There we go. There's my shut up alarm. All right. And where's my Zoom app?